Thank you very much. So, um, thank you for having me over here. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we can do with this thing and why we built it. Um, you may not be able to see it. This is a picture from the inside of one of these massive detectors at the Large Hadron Collider. And what you can see here um, is a person actually standing, I don't know if you can all see it, but there's a person standing here in the middle of this detector. This is actually before, during the construction period, and this object is going to eventually get pulled all the way to the front of it, so it's going to cover the whole space. So to give you an idea, this is, um, this is the border between France and Switzerland. What you can see up here is you're looking kind of, you can see some of the Alps in the background, and, and I'll just point to it. This is the, um, the Geneva Airport. So it gives you a size and scale. The red circle here is where the accelerator exists. So the accelerator is about um, oh, what is it, 27 or so kilometers in circumference. It's a very big device. And each of the, um, the what we call detectors sit at some of these intersection points. And that's what I'll be spending some time talking about. Um, this is one of the components. This is actually a magnet that is being installed, and it was actually um, brought from one side of the site to the other on this very interesting truck. This truck is, I don't know, something like 30 independently actuated wheels to keep the thing level and so, so the thing will move. And this thing weighs tens of tons, this, this magnet. It's actually going over this site, and eventually it gets dropped down underneath the ground where it's going to sit for it. It's about 300 feet of the ground. Um, this shows you actually in some of the installations, you see some people here working on it. And again, this is just to give you an idea of just the, the size of these, these kinds of type of experiments. Um, so what I want to do is give you a little idea of what, why we actually build this thing. And so I'm going to kind of give you a, a primer on particle physics. So this thing, the Large Hadron Collider, is meant to, or built to actually study something we call particle physics. And the big questions that one can ask are, what are we made of? Um, what, what things are actually, you know, people have always been studying for a long time. What are the most fundamental things that make us up? And, you know, you can go back all the way to the Greeks, where they talked about the four basic elements, down to things like atoms, and we now know there are, there are neutrons and particles that are smaller than that. And so that's kind of one of the big basic questions. What are, we, what are the most basic particles? And then something that may not be so obvious to you, but, but there are, are interactions between the particles which actually give rise to all the kinds of things that we know about today. So, so light, gravity, these are the forces that actually interact between particles and they actually have big implications for, for how things work. Um, a big question which you might have heard of is something, what is the origin of mass? Why do things have mass? Why do things interact with gravity? And one of the things that can be actually hopefully answered by this big machine is, is what is the origin of that? Um, and finally, what I'm going to talk about today is what is dark matter. You might have heard this in the nomenclature. People talk about dark matter and dark energy. And what we hope is actually that this machine that we're building will actually answer some of that question. It will tell you exactly what that is. Um, so let me start off by the four forces. The, when we go back to particle physics, we can actually describe all the things that are what we call forces in terms of four fundamental forces. And the forces that we talk about are gravity, the electromagnetic force, the strong and the weak. And they can be described relatively easily here. Gravity is probably one that you're most familiar with. And that's just basically what keeps this planet on the ground. You know, why, why do things fall down towards the center of the Earth? It's because of there's this force called gravity. Um, the electromagnetic force is probably very interesting to you guys because both the, the transmission of, of ham radio is occurs through electromagnetic waves. But actually, an electromagnetic wave also is the reason that you don't fall through the floor because the repulsion between the basically the particles in your feet and the floor is an electromagnetic force. Um, then there are two forces that you don't really hear about too much, but those are the strong force, and that's what keeps the protons and neutrons and nuclei together. And then the weak force is the force that's actually responsible for why the sun shines. Uh, without that, we wouldn't know it. Actually, people 100 years ago thought that the sun was powered by gravity, and then when you work out the numbers, you find out that the sun would only be you know, been, uh, shining for about 100 million years. We believe the sun's been around for billions of years. Um, so the other thing that we can discover with this big machine is actually trying to understand the structure of matter. And, and the way we now understand it is originally people thought about things called atoms. Then there were the nuclei, which is smaller still than the atoms. 
nucleons are, are things like protons and neutrons, which are, make, which are these dots here that you can see inside the nucleus. And now we believe that there are things called quarks, which is made up, which the nucleons are made up of, and we're possibly even probing beyond that. Maybe there are things that are smaller than that. Um, and the reason that we have to build these such large devices is in order to get down to and see things as small, we actually have to have things that are very, very energetic. And I'll talk about that in a second. So, um, ordinary matter that we know of is made up of, in general, six quarks. They have these very strange names, and I won't go through them, and six leptons. The leptons, probably you've heard about things like the, the electron. Well, there are actually um, six of them. Some of them are called neutrinos, and some of them are called electrons and muons. But that's what we believe is making up all of, of matter as we know it. And when I talk about matter as we know it, that is what we call ordinary matter. Um, all these, these um, pieces that we have are part of what we call the standard model of particle physics. The standard model is, is basically that. It's just a model. It's a, it's a way of writing down our understanding of, of how all particles fit together. Um, people have said, though, that the, it's so precise, there have actually been measurements within the standard model that are precise enough that are the same precision that if you were to measure the distance between, say, Los Angeles and New York, you would actually be able to measure the distance down to the width of the hair. And that's the same precision that we actually understand things in this thing we call the standard model. Okay, let me talk about dark matter. Dark matter is a really interesting thing. It turns out that we believe that, that if you look out in the universe, there's this stuff that we call stars. We know about that. Well, it turns out that there are also evidence for other things that, are, that we know cause light to bend. And, and it turns out that things, gravity can bend light. And if you look out in the distance, this is called a bullet galaxy. What happened is actually that two galaxies collided together. The, Red stuff is the ordinary matter because it can interact with more than uh, um, can interact through gravity. It actually tends to clump together in the middle. But the stuff in the purple is actually the dark matter. The dark matter interacts very, very weakly with itself, so it kind of flies by as these two galaxies collide, and yet the stuff in the middle is left. So this is one piece of evidence of dark matter. Um, here's another example of dark matter. You can see that. Here and here, these are actually galaxies. And you can see what this, and what you can see is that they actually look bent. They look like arcs instead of little bowls or, or circles. And that's because there's between us and the galaxy, there's actually this dark matter which is bending the light. And that's called lensing. And there are many, many examples of this out there. So here's an example of what we would see if you had some galaxy out towards the left here and you're sitting out here and looking at the sky, there's this thing which are these patches which are supposed to be dark, dark matter. And between us and that far distant galaxy, there's all this dark matter which we now are looking to map out. And the question is, um, when we look at that, can we tell that there's actually stuff there? And it turns out that there's lots of evidence from that. And in fact, if you were to count up all the matter in the universe, the stuff that we call stars and gas and all that, that's this part right here. So it turns out it's only about 5% of the known universe is made up of what we call ordinary matter. And when I say ordinary matter, those are the things like the electrons and quarks and all that stuff. The rest of it, well, there's this 25%, which is where 23%, which is about, which is the dark matter. And the remaining stuff is something called dark energy. I'm not even going to talk about that. But that's even less well known. People don't even know what, they have no idea what that is. So why am I talking about this? It turns out that in our current understanding of the world that we believe that the dark matter is another fundamental part of it. So I've been talking about these things like quarks and leptons and all that stuff. Well, dark matter, we believe, is yet another particle which has not been seen. And it turns out that a lot of the theories that exist, this dark matter is part of a new theory which we think we can actually see and prove at this Large Hadron Collider. So my point is that the Large Hadron Collider may actually produce this dark matter and we'll actually see it. And by doing that, we'll actually have a lot of evidence for what actually occupies another 25% of the universe. Okay, so um, the point of, of particle physics is to actually look for all these particles and hopefully what we'll see is that they will produce these very, very striking signatures inside of the detectors. Okay, so that's the end of my little, oh, let me tell you one more thing. So um, this equation you've probably seen before, right? And um, 
Let me, if you haven't, I'll tell you what it is. The E over here just means energy. The C squared is, so is you take the speed of light and multiply it by itself, that's C squared, and M is the mass. So if I want to produce a particle of some known mass, I have to have an energy that's multiplied by the speed of light what, or squared. And if you know the speed of light, it's this number here, it's a very, very big number. What that tells you is that even for a very small, massive particle, you have to have a lot of energy. And what that tells you is that you have to build very, very big experiments. Okay, so that's the end of that little term. So now you, now you know all you need to know about particle physics and probably all I know about particle physics. Um, so in order to get to those energies, people have been building colliders for a very, very long time. This is a picture of J.J. Thompson, who was the person who discovered the electron. And he's got this little tube here, which is effectively like a vacuum tube. So I'm sure you guys know all about those. Um, it's effectively a vacuum tube, and he was able to produce little streams of electrons and see them. Um, in the, I think it was in the 40s and 50s, people started building these things called cyclotrons. And, and this is the first one. There's not a good scale, but this thing is about the size of a, a silver dog. So, this scale. Um, in the 70s, we built even bigger uh, accelerators. This is at Stanford Linear Accelerator. And to give you an idea of the size of this, um, I, I worked there when I was an undergraduate. This is a car. So it's a pretty big device, but it's not the biggest. Um, in the 80s, if you ever go to Fermi, uh, Chicago, just outside of Chicago in Batavia, there's an accelerator called Fermilab. This thing, I, I believe, if I remember, is about three miles in circumference. So if you want to see the size of a car, so this is a parking lot down here. And now we're at the, the LHC. And the LHC, as I said before, this is the Geneva Airport. This thing crosses the border. Well, actually, you can see it. This is the border between France and Switzerland. You can see, believe it or not, they actually crosses the border many times. And that's just because, well, it's those French and, and Swiss, you know, they could just, the border is not straight. You know, so it crosses the border. OK. So let, this will give you kind of an idea of, of how long it's taking to come to fruition. Um, the actual design of this was um, started in the, in the mid-80s and it's continued and it was only completed in 2008. So it's a project that's been moving on you know, on a scale of decades. Um, and um, this was actually when they first proposed one of the detectors, the experiments was in the, mid, in the early 90s. As the University, the University of Arizona joined this um, in, in 1994, um, the experiment, even though we had joined it and been proposed, wasn't officially approved until after we joined it. And that wasn't because of us, it just happened to be the time scale. Um, and then this is, um, in 2007 was when they actually had the last magnet installed and the whole construction was complete. This is actually one of these magnets. This is a superconducting magnet, so it's filled with uh, liquid helium. And I don't remember the length, but it's, it's something on the order of you know, 8 or 10 meters long. It's a very long device. But if you think of how long this thing is, it's 23 kilometers in circumference. You've got thousands of objects. And then the, the experiment is completed in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you an idea of what happens in this accelerator. So in, in Atlas, what happens is that there are two tubes, they're called beam tubes, and we're going to inject two beams of protons. So those are just like hydrogen, you know, the um, nuclei from a hydrogen atom. Um, one goes this way, and the other goes this way. The reason it goes in a circle is, is twofold. One is that in order to, these beams, if you have two beams of particles, you want them to collide, the number of times that you actually have something happen when the, the beams go past each other is small, so they recirculate the beams many, many times to get, them, to, to get collisions. Um, in order to go in a circle, you remember your high school physics, that a, a charged particle going through a magnetic field bends. And so there are these large number of magnets like we saw before, and by having these magnets, it causes them to bend. Um, one of the problems of a particle that bends is it loses energy. And so there are these, what are called accelerator cavities, or RF cavities, which pump energy back into the beam to make sure the beam continues along its path. And then there are regions where the two beam pipes are brought together, and the beams are allowed to collide, and that's called the detector. And so the collider, the, the big part of it is meant to just produce, allow particles to go around circles and hit each other. But then you want to find out what happened. And that's done in these detectors. So um, I'll show you a couple of pictures. This is again one of these magnets that's being installed. 
this is one of these big RF cameras. And so you, you have um, um, RF energy that's pumped into the beam, and basically the, the particles ride along it like, it, like they kind of surf along this RF um, wave. Um, this shows you, it's a little bit of a movie, and it basically shows as we zoom down into the underground cavern, remember this is about 100 meters underground, it's going to open up to show you what it looks like. And this is one of the detectors that sits inside this cavern. Um, you can kind of see, it's made up, it's like an onion. There are various layers that are composed it. And this is showing you what a person would look like as they walk along. It's going to zoom out and you can again kind of see what the scale of this object is. And the person is right there. And here is the schematic. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. Again, it's kind of got an onion-like structure. And the reason for that is we're going to have these two beams collide, and we're going to have stuff coming out of it. We want to be able to identify what that stuff is, to then infer what took place at the collision point. And that, that's the goal of this. So here's actually what happens. This is a little movie of different types of particles going through a cross section. So there's the beam pipe. This is an electron. And what happens, you can see that an electron comes through here, bends a little bit, and then splashes in here. This is a photon, and a photon doesn't leave any signature in here, but it splashes in here. A proton goes in the opposite direction of the electron because it has a different charge. It moves in this direction, splashes in the second part, and a neutron splashes, but it doesn't leave anything in here. And finally, this thing called a muon um, here goes up and reaches all the way to the outside. So I'm not going to go through all the details of it, but what that basically says is that if you have different types of particles, they interact differently in the detector. So by looking at the interaction of the detector, you can then infer what type of particle that was. And by knowing those particles, you can infer what took place in the interaction. So, so that's what the detector does. Um, the reason it's so big, this thing has a, is, is um, the length of it is about 150 feet. So it's about half the length of a football field long, and then about something like 75 or 80 feet tall. Um, and the reason it has to be that big is because since the particles, the protons that are colliding have such large energies, it produces sub secondary particles which also have large energies. So to collect those particles, you need a very, very big thing. And this thing is called a detector. This will give you some of the numbers. So it's, it's 46 meters long. It's about half the length of a football field. And it weighs about 7,700 tons. Um, if you were to, I mean, I, to give you a scale, um, in terms of 747s, so if you took 100 empty ones, that's about how much this detector would weigh. We're going to actually write about 32 terabytes of data. Again, you know, uh, you know, a big disk that you can go buy at Best Buy now can, can hold about a terabyte, and we're going to write about a thousand of them in a year. So it's a very, very large amount of data. Um, this will kind of give you an idea of the energy at, at the center when the two particles hit. If you were to translate that into an energy, it would be 100,000 times. Sun. Um, we'll have lots of collisions. And the other thing that's kind of interesting, shown in this picture, is that in order to build these large experiments and do something with it, you need a lot of people. So there are about 2,500 physicists, so people with a, you know, like a PhD, who are working on this experiment just to do one um, so this gives you some of the things that we did here at the University of Arizona. Um, one of the things that we did was we helped build what are called calorimeters. And, and you know, calorimeter just means something that measures energy. And as you saw in that little movie, um, it, when these particles splash in the detector, they deposit their energy. And so we were involved in building that. What's interesting about it is that um, our group here at the University of Arizona is considered a small group in particle physics. We have five faculty members. Um, and we originally were associated with some of the experiment for the collider called the SSC down in Texas, which was canceled about almost 20 years ago now. Um, and um, at that time, we went and joined this experiment, and they had a very different design for their detector. And this will give you an idea. They, the detector that they were building, which is called these calorimeters, are right here. And when we joined the experiment, we convinced them that that design was the wrong design. And so what happened is that the design now looks like this based on the contribution from the University of Arizona. Uh, we actually were able to convince them that they want to put 
that thing if I go back, this thing inside the detector, and now here it is and it's actually located here. So by doing that, it, it changed the, drastically the configuration of the experiment, and we believe it actually will make the detector more robust, and we won't have as much background in it um, from other signals. So, um, this is actually the construction of it, is one of our under, uh, technicians working on it. Um, here's this detector. So the detector is really not that big. You can see that it went from being something that's the size of you know, as tall as this room to something that you can sit on one of these tables. And, and by doing that, um, so this is one of the ones that we built. Um, you can see it being created up to go off the stern. So it was built here in the basement of the physics building. And then it had to be shipped all around the world. What's great about it is that you know, it had to go on. It was kind of like trains, planes, and automobiles. It, on, it went on a truck. You can see it here being lifted onto the truck. Um, then it went on to a boat, and then it was on the truck again. And it went all the way to, to Switzerland, and then they dropped it. <laughs> right, right, right when they got there, there was a crane operator there. He picked it up, and, and he didn't have it on his crane, and it fell right up. Right. And this is just some of the pictures. This little circle here was supposed to be the center. It's one of these, it's, I don't know what you call them, but it's, it's, uh, a, uh, it's supposed to show you the thing hasn't been shaken. Well, you can see it's, it's, it's been shaken. Well, they went through and looked at it. It turned out it was built robustly enough that after a few months of refurbishing it, they were actually able to install it. You can see it actually being installed here in the detector. So it actually... Um, one of the things, as I said before, is that the data that's produced is, is a very, very high level of data. And one of the things that's actually come out of that is that people have had to look at new ways to handle large amount of data. And that's... Um, created something called grid computing. And, and, and the particle physics community is actually driving this whole thing because of the amounts of data. This is actually one of the grid centers, and, and each of these is a multi-CPU processor. You see, we have you know, buildings with rooms of these things located all around the world. So the data gets shipped to these sites all around the world, it gets processed, and eventually this, this, the, um, the, the results end up on your desktop somewhere. But, but um, that's what the process is. Okay, so, you know, one, one a number of years ago, somebody said, uh, did, a, did a survey saying, well, what are you going to see when you do this? Because, you know, it's very, it, it seems very, um, uh, you know, you have these hypothetical things that you're looking for. Is it, is it really real? So they did a survey, and it turns out that nobody really knows what's going to happen. We're going to turn it on and hope for the best. Um, so this is just a recent cartoon that's made. Um, so in September, about a year ago, it was really exciting. I actually stayed up to do this, to see this. Um, they actually turned it on. And they were able to, um, within an hour, send part of protons all the way around the ring, which was actually very good, because the previous time that they turned on a machine this size, it took them a, week, a few days to a week to, to get that to work. So within an hour, things were working great. Um, this is a movie of one of the, this is, again, the Atlas detector with stuff that actually hit it from this first time they turned it on. And you can see, they, they did, it's kind of a cheap. They actually took the beam and splashed, hit it into a piece of metal upstream of the detector, and you get the splash of stuff coming down. But it makes a very dramatic picture. Um, but then, nine days later, we have this accident. And the accident was much more severe. When I first heard about it, I thought, oh, you know, they, it's a little thing. These are, this is the junction between two of the magnets. And you can see this thing actually is completely shifted. To give you an idea, remember these magnets weigh, you know, tons. And you can see this is actually the floor underneath the magnet. And this is the, the, the mount. And it broke the concrete, completely destroyed it. Um, and it turns out that the culprit was they, um, these magnets are superconducting, and this is, gives you a picture of the conductor that conducts and connects, um, connects two magnets. And it appears that what happened was that the, the junction is made by, there's copper um, here, the actual superconducting um, material is here, and then there's solder. This is kind of solid. They put this whole thing together, and this is what it looks like. So here's the copper, there's the, the superconducting um, uh, conductor here, and then there's supposed to be solder, and it appears that somehow they didn't put enough solder or any solder at all. And that created a resistive junction, and when you're putting that in the ends, it turns out that um, you get massive burn. I mean, I mean, they had um, um, megawatts of power going through this thing where it became uns where it was no longer superconducting. Um, this is the burning that you can see. Uh, here's again some of the burning that actually occurred, and give you some of the numbers. 
Um, there are all kinds of things that happen. I mean, you, I'm sure many of you know that anytime you um, have an accident of this scale, it's, it's a series of things that happen, not just one. So in addition to the lack of solder, there was a, a detection system that was built in the magnets, but not in the junctions. And then that protection system in the junctions, which they did have, was set about a factor of three or four too high. So it couldn't, it couldn't actually have, have met, seen the, the failure until well after it happened. Um, so they, um, they had about four megawatts of power going through that system. And it was enough that they blew open the, a hole in the, the, um, the helium enclosure. But when you do that, something like liquid helium, which suddenly becomes room temperature, it's explosive. And you had explosive um, expansion of the helium, and it completely blew the magnet off. It actually blew soot down the beam pipe about 700 meters in both direction. Um, here's another picture, and this just shows some of the soot as it was being forced out of some of the ports in the magnet. There's an overprotection system that was too, uh, it wasn't big enough to so it turns out that they had to require to remove 53 magnets. That doesn't sound like a lot, but remember these magnets are 300 feet underground. They're all around the ring, and they have to be ported to a few access ports and brought all the way up to the surface. And they were also at cold liquid helium temperatures. So um, they're soot, and they retrofitted. It turned out it took them about a year to do that. Um, here is one of the, the facility where they were actually testing and retrofitting the magnets. This gives you again the scale of magnets. So here's a person, and here's one of the magnets process being retrofitted. And here's one of the magnets after they So they were able to repair it, and we actually, um, on November 23rd, they were actually able to have their first collision. So even after they started up, they only started putting beams in one direction. They actually had their first collisions um, just about two months ago now. And um, this is actually, I guess I forgot to turn on the sound, but this is the day that they actually had their first collisions. You can see people all in the control room. Um, and this is the very first um, event that they had where they actually had two flight beams, and this was in the end of the Okay. So then, um, the, um, the milestones are such that we turned it on the first time about a year ago. Um, there was this accident two days later. It was restarted just a couple months ago. We had our first collisions, and then they ran um, until December 18th. So it was actually about a month of running with these first collisions at very, very low energies. But in spite of that, at the time, by the time they had, um, a week after they had actually had first collisions, it had become the most powerful machine on the earth. It had, it had overtaken the Fermilab accelerator as a um, So what's going to happen next? Actually, in, in um, less than a week, they're going to turn on again. So they, they shut down after they had this engineering run, and they're going to start taking data for at least a year. It's actually probably going to be close to two years. At that point, they'll become a discovery machine. So we should actually have the an opportunity to see some of the things. And hopefully this year we'll actually start to see the first results from the machine. Maybe we'll even see things in dark. So this is just a brief thing. You know, one of the things that people always ask, well, why do you do this and, and does it have any impact on what we do? And the answer is yes in kind of an ancillary way. Um, it turns out that some of the more um, recent um, cancer um, tools are proton accelerators. And, and these are direct spin-offs of, of the types of things that we've seen. In fact, there's a can there is a cancer center using this technology at Fermilab, just outside of Chicago. Um, the other thing, which you may or may not know, you may have heard this, is that the World Wide Web actually was de developed at CERN as a way for the scientists to communicate with each other. And of course, now it's taken on a life of its own. We, you know, the scientists don't own it. They basically develop this the language, HTML, and that's now become pretty much a standard, which has since you know, completely overtaken the particle physics community by far. Um, but I do remember as a, a, you know, about in the early 90s of being introduced to this language saying, oh, what's anybody going to do with this? I mean, it's, it's kind of cute. Um, but we were using it, you know, to share documents. Now it's, it's you know, doing much more than that. Um, and this, I kind of like it. This is, this is an article from, um, I think it was the New York Times, when um, Edison invited a reporter down to his lab in New Jersey. 
to talk about the light bulb. He had just developed the light bulb and he brought somebody down and, and the reporter uh, basically said, you know, it's not clear what this thing is going to do. Why would anybody want these light bulbs? We've got this great gas in the system. Um, and that's how we kind of take it for the LHC. And we were developing these tools to understand basic science, but, you know, who knows? There's a lot of things that come out of it. Some of them direct more of them secondary, but maybe even just by discovering these new particles, just like the discovery of the electron could lead to new interesting things. Um, this is just a picture of some of the people. We have five faculty, a number of staff currently on our program. And one thing that we're really proud of is the fact that we've always in, um, involved undergraduates um, at the university, and actually a number of them have been over to Geneva to, to work on this experiment. So that's it. I just wanted to end with this. It's kind of an interesting picture. It's just the scale of it is always impressive to me. And, um, and I'll just end there. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the God particle, or the, 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 is it the Higgs boson? That's right. So the question is the Higgs boson. Uh, is that the only particle that they're expecting to, to uh, isolate or to actually discover? Or no, actually, so the question was whether or not you could, is there something called the Higgs particle, which I didn't really talk about. Um, is that the only particle that, excuse me, that we expect to see um, with this machine? And actually, no. The answer is there's a whole plethora of things that we hope to see. One of them is this dark matter particle, um, which could be a super symmetric particle. Um, and the Higgs particle is another particle, and that's the one that we believe is responsible for why things have mass. Um, the, if supersymmetry um, exists, this dark matter um, candidate, then we would actually see a whole plethora of new types of particles. Yeah. Is any of this data that the collider collects going to be offered up through uh, the Poink system? Through the Poink system? Um, I don't believe so. So the question was, is any of the data going to be offered up to the point, point system? Point. The Berkeley Open Off Infrastructure for Network. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so no. Typically what happens, um, there, there are very different scientific communities. So the astronomy community, for instance, is very much into open data. Where they'll share all the data, they'll show you where all the stars are. The particle physics community isn't necessarily um, a closed community, but often um, there are a couple um, interesting aspects of, of particle physics. One is just the size of the data. You know, we're going to have petabytes of data um, before we're done. And then the other thing, which is more kind of a cultural thing, is that the, in order to analyze the data, there's a very, very detailed process of doing that, including all this software, which has been developed to actually read back the data. Um, and it requires um, a huge amount of overhead. In fact, I still don't even understand it, the software. Um, so it's, it's, it's mostly um, because of cultural reasons that's really not offered up for people to look at themselves. But there's no, there's no real underlying reason why we don't. It's just that culturally we've never really done it. Well, not, not so much as to look at the data, but to process the data in a grid computing uh, atmosphere. Uh, then I guess I don't understand your question. I mean, is any, is any of the data that is collected going to be offered up through the uh, grid computing network around the world so that uh, computers like the ones I have at home can uh, chew up some of this data? Yeah, no, the, the grids that people are using are actually basically systems that are either um, at, at national labs or big university systems. So, um, and there's no particularly, well, the reason is because, again, it's running very, not proprietary, but our own version of software. And so each of the systems has to have that, that software system installed. And that system is, um, has a very, very large database and a very, very large um, software um, infrastructure, which is, turns out has, has a lot of overhead to actually install. You can't just you know take a package of tart and install it. Turns out there's there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that has to work. It's not because it's because we're particularly bad at managing software that we that it happens that way. It's not because we want people to not have access to the data. But but so yeah, it's not something that can be that will be running in the background 
like the, the SETI type thing. It's something that actually has to have a dedicated machine that, that loads all the software and all the data, punches on it, and then spits back the answer. So they're, they're part of these very, very large data um, um, centers that are being installed. And, and these centers have a thousand CPUs, and that's where the data will be processed. Resource? Resource, yeah. At multiple kilometers wide, uh, how is this thing going to guarantee its human resource? So the, um, that's a good. So the question is, you know, we how, we use a lot of helium, and um, how are we going to guarantee it? The um, there are two things. First of all, helium is mined, which you may probably know. So so you can't just collect it from the atmosphere or something. So there. Are, so you're right. There's a limited supply of, of helium out there. Um, in fact, when they one of the delays in getting the thing started was actually getting enough helium because there was so much helium in the system. The helium actually is um, recirculated. So the actual usage of helium, and I don't know what the exact number is, is relatively low as long as they don't have an accident like they did. When they have an accident like they did, they lose a lot of helium in the atmosphere. But once they have, have purchased the helium for the system, it's a closed loop system and it's, it's recirculated, it's, it's re, it's re um, um, liquefied. So they have a big helium liqui liquefaction plant on site. Hi, I've seen the system that detected as an ellipse. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. Some drawings show it as a circle, true circle, and some drawings show it as a Oh, you mean the, the collider, whether the collider is a little, it's, it's a circle. True circle. Okay. It's a first product, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's going to have some deep, but it's basically a circle. And then some other Yeah. question is, if it's the question is why? Oh, the tilt, and I can't remember how much of a tilt it is. I believe that's correct, but there is a tilt. The problem is that if you think, look at where it goes, the, the thing actually goes underneath the Jura Mountains. The, the collider um, goes across the border between France and Switzerland, but also goes over the mountains. And at some point, if you get too below the mountains, you actually start getting water and things like that. So I think, I believe, I don't, I'm not positive, but I believe that the reason that it has some sort of inclination is basically because of that. But, but I'm not actually positive about that. Yeah. Is there any reason why you uh, use helium, liquid helium instead of liquid nitrogen? Yeah, so uh, the question was why do we use liquid helium versus liquid nitrogen? To get to the, the superconductor, superconductor at a certain temperature. And it turns out that there are very few superconductors that superconduct at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So to get down to the, the superconductor, it's kept about, about 2 degrees, 1.9 degrees uh, Kelvin, which is right above you know, absolute zero. So um, this, I believe the... Um, the superconductor is niobium, and that one only can superconducts, you know, at, at very, very low temperatures. Liquid nitrogen wouldn't get low enough. Yeah. Presume this uh, running this machine takes a great deal of electricity. Presume a significant fraction of at least the local electric supply. Well, what kind of uh, procedures have to be uh, developed, and how much it does use? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I don't actually know. The, the question was, you know, how, how is this, collect, I guess, connected to the grid, uh, the electrical grid there? There are, um, it's certainly, uh, I can, let me answer that in kind of a backwards way, in that um, one of the issues uh, has traditionally been that they shut down both during Christmas for just because of the holidays, and also during the summers because summers typically have a large um, energy draw. Um, so there is an issue in terms of power, and I believe, I, I don't remember what the actual number is, but it's basically enough power to, to power a small town or city in, in Europe. So, well, small town in anyway. So it is a significant, and one of the reasons it's uses superconducting magnets is actually to reduce the electrical draw, because otherwise it would be, it would be impossible uh, given, given the infrastructure to actually mine it. How did the detector discern or detect the happening? Outside the, the, the brain, so to speak. 
So that's a very good question. You know, even at 100 meters, so the question is, how do you discern that the, basically the, the, the events are happening from the collisions as opposed to something else, right? And it's, um, it turns out because it's so big, it's actually bombarded by cosmic rays all the time. So we actually see a large flux of cosmic rays, and when there was no beam, it was, those cosmic rays were actually used to, um, to help see whether the detector was working. So we, we could actually see cosmic rays coming into the detector, and, and there are lots of pictures of things like that. Um, the, the, way, the first way that, that you know that it's actually happening from the beam is we know when the two, when the two beams are going to hit each other. And so the events are usually timed such that we only open up our gates and trigger the events during collision times. So that reduces you know, some of the rate from cosmic rays. The other thing is that cosmic rays in general, those events don't point back to the, where the collisions happen. And most of the events from our detector as well. But there are times when we'll have a real event which overlaps with a real cosmic ray. And in those cases, we have to use other tricks, which are just kind of um, tricks of software and analysis to get rid of those things. But yeah, there, there actually are a problem. Yeah. Um, when you feed, uh, feed the, uh, the, the, the circle panel uh, with uh, whatever the particles are being sent there, do you send a straight stream of these, or do you bring it down to like one or two? No, that's a great question. So the question was, what, what are we sending through? So first of all, we're sending protons. So um, how do you make protons? Well, basically what you do is take a bunch of helium gas, a hydrogen gas, and strip off the electrons, and that's easy to do, and then you have protons. So you send protons one way and protons the other way, and they're sent in bunches, and, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but there are bunches of protons, um, and there'll be hundreds of bunches um, located throughout the ring going in one direction and hundreds of, of bunches going the other way. And these bunches will be timed so they collide with these interaction points um, every few um, nanoseconds, actually. So the, the, the rate of them is actually going to be very high. In that regard, how do you control uh, uh, so that the, the collision will actually happen inside more of the detectors? So in order to make sure that the two bunches collide inside the detectors, the, the, the bunches are kept going around by these RF cavities, these, these RF generators. And those RF generators have a well-defined um, timing structure. Um, and so that timing structure, um, and I forget what the range is, um, is timed so that a bunch is basically being pushed along one of the crests of these, of these RF waves. And so by the fact that you have some going this way and some this way, you can actually time that very easily to make sure they collide at the right point. The other thing which I didn't say, there are actually two separate tubes. Um, for one tube goes this way and the other tube goes the other way. Those tubes only, inter those tubes only intersect at where the detectors are. Otherwise, they're actually separate back in tubes in each direction. Yeah, uh, what's the reason for the So the question was, why do we use these superconducting magnets? The magnetic field inside is, I believe it's 12 Tesla. Um, that's a huge magnetic field. Um, a, the magnetic field, for instance, from the Earth's atmosphere is about half a gauss. So that's, a Tesla is 10,000 gauss. So it's, it's, it's orders of magnitude stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And some of the strongest magnets that have ever been built are about 100 Tesla or something like that. In order to get to those fields, you have to have a huge amount of current running through the magnets. And the only way you can keep the currents going without having immense amounts of power is to make them superconducting to reduce the resistance. So that, that's basically why. Both a little silly. If you've got two tubes, one going in each direction, and you've got the collider chamber, whatever you call it, and they come in from the opposite directions, how do you make sure that once they go into this chamber, they continue, that the guys coming from this way don't go up the wrong tube? Oh, that's a very good question. So the question is, you have these two tubes that intersect, and how do you make sure they go, each one's going in the right tube? They actually intersect not completely head on but a slight angle. And so when they intersect, they, they more or less hit an angle. But one of them's already heading in that direction, one of them's heading in this direction. So they're actually heading down the two separate tubes separately. Um, 
And then, I'm sorry, you had a second question. And the other question was regarding a slide you showed earlier in the um, presentation about something being, I think it's like a hundred times or a thousand times hotter than the sun. Right. How do they contain that heat? So, um, so it's, what I, the, I no, the question, no, that was a great question. So one of the second things I said was that the, um, if you were to take the energy of these two protons hitting, that would be equivalent to a temperature of about 100,000 times the, the heat of the, the temperature of the sun. Well, there's not exactly a lie, but there's a difference between temperature and heat. So, but that just means that these two particles have enough energy that if you were to convert that energy into a temperature, that would give a very, very high temperature. But heat is really kind of a cumulative thing of lots of them. And they, you don't have enough protons to make up a, a sun, so you just have very few protons, relatively speaking, hitting each other. So only at the interaction point. Another way of saying that the total energy of each particle is very, very high, but the total energy is equivalent to the energy of, say, for instance, you know, mosquitoes fly. I mean, it's, it's very little total, total real energy in terms of, and that's what you would think of as heat. So there's not a lot of heat. It's just if you would take that energy and convert it to a temperature, that's, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> right. Uh, what's the, um, what is I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the last one. <laughs> Oh, you mean what percentage of, of the times you... So, yeah, the, the probability of collision is actually very, very low. We measured it in cross-section, cross I don't remember the number offhand. But so, and I forget the real numbers, but effectively that every time there's a, a crossing of, of these two beams, there's kind of a probability of a few of those protons, and there are, there are, I don't remember the exact numbers, but billions of protons, say, for instance, that are in each watch or whatever it is, and only a few of them will interact. So, so there's very low probability of even with those bunches of one interaction. Um, but what happens is because we have so many bunches crossing all at once, you can have, at any given time, when you trigger, you're going to have, on average, a few events actually occurring at the same time. And one of the, one of the hard parts is actually figuring out if there are more than one interaction at the same time, what they all feel. But, but the, the interaction probability is actually very low, and that's why you have so many bunches and so many particles. Yeah, I get it. What else have you come through the besides protons? Um, the question is, what else can you put through the t through the collider? Um, th it's actually a very interesting thing, and it's a great question because um, for what we're doing, we want to have very very fundamental interactions, and so we just have these protons hitting. But you can actually look at collisions of all kinds of different things. So they'll be putting things like gold atoms and, and lead atoms and other heavier atoms colliding together, and that gives you a lot of information about the structure of nuclear material. So, so that's actually something that's been very interesting. It's actually not the field that I'm interested in, but so nuclear physicists are often interested in those types of interactions. And there's an experiment, not our experiment, but another experiment, which is meant to actually look at those types of interactions. For their other detectors. Right, so I didn't quite show it, but this is just one of the detectors. There are basically four main detectors. Um, two of them, one of them called the Atlas detector is the one I described. The other one is called the CMS detector. It's very similar to the one I have shown. Um, and there are two other detectors. One of them called the Alice detector is meant for exactly that, for looking at collisions of heavier nuclei. Um, after you did the experiment, did you see any So the question is, how, how would you, after you look at all the data, how would you apply it to space as a whole? The, the point about it is that um, what people have some very interesting theories of what, what the world looks like as you get, one of, one of the questions you might have, maybe it's not rattling around in your head right now, but one of the questions you could have is what really happened if there was a big bang, what, what, was, what did it look like at the very, very beginning? And, and a lot of those particles that were produced have never been seen again because you need these very, very high energies to produce them. After they're produced, because they're so heavy, they almost decay right away to other particles and you never see those very, very um, fundamental um, you know, prehistoric particles. So this thing actually should be able to produce some of those particles and from that we would actually be able to validate basically what the world looked like a very, very long time ago. 
<laughs> you know, it's always one of those things. Everybody's always looking at the next thing. What's what's actually interesting is that our group here at the University, University of Arizona is already um, building prototypes for the upgrade of this machine. So one of the things that they want to do is not necessarily upgrade it to higher energies, but higher rates to get more and more interactions to even get a uh, better view of what's uh, to produce more of these kinds of particles. So we're working on that. There's also an effort to. Um, build what's called a linear collider, where you'd have a very, very long device, and you'd have particles coming from both ends. And there's some advantages to having something which is straight rather than curved. Um, and so that's kind of the next thing. Now, people have been talking about that for 20 years, and it's still not really on the horizon. So who knows when that would happen. But, but everybody talks about the next, the next big thing. You know, you know you, at night when you're falling asleep, you can always dream about something. Just as a scale, um, there's a big trench, a leftover trench over lots of Ashes, Texas. If you need to scale up, there's a big trench there already. Yeah, so that was the, you're saying in Waxahachie, Texas, right outside of Dallas, there's the beginnings of what was the SSC. They actually dug, I believe, a quarter of the tunnel. But, um, so the thing was going to be about 53 miles in circumference. So, so something about that, two and a half times bigger than this thing um, in terms of scale. Um, you know, they canceled it after they saw cost overruns and all this other stuff. But they actually built that tunnel, and, and I don't actually know what they, they there was some crazy talk about building a mushroom farm and all kinds of other stuff. But I believe the tunnel's still there, though I'm not sure. They may have filled in parts of it. So how was all this paid for? So the question was, how was it paid for? It's actually paid for, this, this is at, at a place called CERN. CERN is a, a multinational laboratory. So there are, and the US is a, not a member state, but a contributing state or something like that. Um, that is paid for, for our contribution from the US is paid for the Department of Energy. So the Department of Energy um, finances all kinds of things. One of them is basic research. Um, the Department, so the Department of Energy, just to give you an idea, morphed from what used to be the Atomic Energy um, Commission and all those things. So that unit was the one that financed all the nuclear um, energy and atomic bomb development that started in World War II, and it's morphed into what we have now. So the particle physics contribution of the whole Department of Energy is actually a very, very small fraction, but that's how, how a lot of this is funded from us. But there, I don't remember how many states there are something. Um, something like there are 20 countries that are member states of CERN, and they all have some contribution that they make to this. Give you an idea, just the cost of this, uh, somebody asked me one time, I couldn't, have no idea, but the cost of it total is about $10 billion. So you can say that either that's a lot of money or it's going to drop in the bucket relative to it. It is a lot of money. Um, why is there only one colliding chamber in there, and why did they make it in a circle instead of a straight line? So the question was, why is there only one colliding? There actually are four different sections where there are collisions happening. Um, and, and that, you know, why you have one, four versus ten, is really a function of um, civil construction. How many of these places can you build on the ground that you can afford? And also, how many experiments can you think of that you would want to put down there? And so there actually, I think, a few more than four, but four is really the big number of big chambers. Um, why would you make it in a circle? Well, the reason you make it in a circle is because it's, um, well, first of all, to get to the energy that they want, um, or let me turn around. The first thing you want to do is you want to have lots of collisions. So you want to have these particles go around and around and around the times that you want. And so that gives rise to the circle. But in order to make sure that you don't lose too much energy, you have to make the circle a little bit big. Um, a something that's straight, the amount of energy loss is much smaller than if it goes in a circle. So that's why you would build something straight. But then in order to get the energy that you want, you would have to make it much bigger, uh, much longer. Well, I, that's it. I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting me.